Welcome to Module 4. After finishing the bones and the joints, we may now study the muscular system. Muscles are organs that contract to produce movement. This module is focused mainly on the skeletal muscle of dog. Although detailed myology is available for study, this lecture will just give you an overview of the common muscles observed during dissection with some information on their physiological and basic clinical importance. Take note that the topics were arranged per region of the body as it is the best presentation in most textbooks as well as it stimulates the feeling of actual muscle dissection. This module is divided into four lecture presentations and was based on the muscles of the head, the trunk, and the limb region. At the end of this module, you should be able to identify the different muscles of the body and identify the main action of each muscle. The bulk of the muscles in the body is skeletal muscle. Here is the general overview of the group of muscles that you will be studying in this module. We will be discussing the muscles of the head, the muscles of the trunk, the muscles of the thoracic limb, and finally the muscles of the pelvic limb. But before we start, let us discuss some important terms that are necessary in studying muscles. Tendons are fibrous bands of collagen connecting muscles to bone. Aponeuroses are tendons associated with flat muscles. The origin is the less movable attachment, while the insertion is the more movable attachment. Belly is the thick fleshy central part of a muscle. Intrinsic muscles lie completely within one region of the body where they have their origin and insertion, in contrast to the extrinsic muscle which run from one region of the body to another. Aside from this, there is a list of muscle name derivation on the handout provided. Please read them so that you can have additional idea on how the muscles were named. Let us begin with the muscles of the head. For easier familiarization, most anatomy references group the musculature of the head based on their role or main action. First, we have the masticatory muscles. These muscles are powerful for the mastication of food. Normally, they have attachments to the mandible and contractions produce jaw movement associated with chewing. Next are the muscles of facial expression or the mimetic muscles. This group of muscles move the skin and appendages of the face and the head, the ears for example for the animal to show any reaction like aggression. Other muscles of the head includes the tongue muscles and the extraocular muscles of the eye. We will discuss each group in the next slides. The first muscle of mastication to be discussed is the digastricus or the biventer. Take note that this is the only muscle that opens the jaw. This is being aided by the gravity. The rest of the masticatory muscles open the jaw. This muscle originates at the jugular process of the occipital bone and inserts at the angle and ventral surface of the mandible. Next is the masseter. It closes the jaw and it lies lateral to the mandible. It is located at the deep masseteric fossa of the mandible of the dog. This muscle originates at the zygomatic arc and inserts at the masseteric fossa on the lateral surface of the mandible. The temporalis muscle closes the jaw as well. It is the strongest muscle of the head in carnivores. It covers much of the dorsal and lateral surface of the skull. To complete the muscles of mastication, a deeper muscle called medial and lateral pterygoids lie medial to the mandible. Here is a lateral view of the head with the ramus of the mandible removed to show the pterygoidus muscle. They aid the temporalis and masseter in closing the jaw, but they are also responsible for the side-to-side -side movement typical of herbivore mastication. The muscles of facial expression or the mimetic muscles are generally thin cutaneous muscles innervated by the facial nerve. They can be further subdivided into muscles of the cheek, lips, forehead, and the eyelid. There are two muscles of the cheek responsible for the dog's facial expression. 
First is the platysma. This is a relatively well-developed sheet of cutaneous muscle that draws the angle of the mouth caudally. It originates at the dorsal raphe of the neck and inserts at the commissure of the lips. The second one is the buccinator. If we remove the superficial structures, we can see the buccinators. It is a thin, wide sheet of muscle that forms the non-cutaneous substance of the chick. Its contraction draws the chick inward against the teeth. There are five known muscles that acts on the lips. First is the levator nasolabialis. From the name itself, it elevates the nasolabial area. It is one of the most superficial muscle layer covering the lateral surface of the nasal bone and the maxilla just deep to the skin. Contraction causes the dilatation of the nostrils and it raises the upper lip. Next, around the opening of the mouth is the orbicularis oris. It lies deep in the platysma and levator nasolabialis. Its fibers run longitudinally and contraction closes the lips by drawing them together into the shape of an O. Zygomaticus, or the smiling muscle, draws the angle of the mouth caudally and external ear cranially and ventrally. Mentalis is essentially a subdivision of the ventral part of the buccinator. Contraction stiffens the apical region of the lower lip. Finally, the maxillonasolabialis is a specialization of the dorsal part of the orbicularis oris. It is divided into two portions, both of which lie deep to the levator nasolabialis. The levator labi superioris is the more dorsal portion. It raises the upper lip and dilates the nostrils, while the caninus is the more ventral portion. It is similar origin with the levator labi superioris, but it inserts only into the upper lip. Its contraction raises the upper lip. There is one major muscle of the forehead, and that is the frontalis. It is a thin sheet of muscle overlying the temporalis muscle. Its contraction draws the scutellar cartilage forward and raises the eyebrow. There are five muscles known to act on the eyelids. First is the orbicularis oculi. It surrounds the palpebral fissure and contraction closes the said fissure. The retractor anguli oculi lateralis passes directly caudally from the lateral palpebral angle to blend with the temporal fascia. It draws the lateral palpebral angle caudally thereby assisting in the closing of the eye. On the other hand, the counterpart levator anguli oculi medialis passes directly from the medial palpebral angle to attach to the frontal bone. It raises the upper lid and erects the hair of the eyebrow. A dorsal view of the head musculature to show the retractor anguli oculi lateralis and the levator anguli oculi medialis. As previously mentioned, other muscles of the head include the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the tongue. Let us begin with the extraocular muscles. These are the striated muscles that lie within the orbit associated with the globe of the eye. They are called extraocular because they are attached to the outside of the eyeball. These muscles enables the globe of the eye to move in the many directions of which it is capable. There are eight extraocular muscles which is divided into four rectus muscle, two oblique muscles, and one retractor muscle. The dorsal rectus elevates the globe while the opposite ventral rectus depresses the globe. The lateral rectus turns the globe temporally or laterally, while the medial rectus turns the globe nasally or medially. The dorsal oblique intorts the globe or it rotates the 12 o'clock position nasally, while the ventral oblique extorts the globe or it rotates the 12 o'clock position temporally. The remaining retractor bulbi retracts the globe. 
The muscles of the tongue can be grouped into intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. The intrinsic muscles of the tongue are arranged in fascicles that run longitudinally, transversely, and vertically allowing the tongue to change shape in multiple planes. The extrinsic muscles of the tongue are those that arise from the outside of the tongue. It includes the styloglossus, hyoglossus, and the genioglossus. The styloglossus extends from the stylohyoid to the tongue. It has three muscle heads that inserts at the tongue at different level. It draws the tongue caudally. The genioglossus is a thin triangular muscle at the intermandibular space ventral to the tongue. Contraction draws the entire tongue rostrally. It depresses the tongue. And finally, the hyoglossus is located at the root of the tongue. It retracts and depresses the tongue. That ends our presentation on this part of the module. As a start, it may be difficult for you to remember all the muscles discussed. As a tip, it will be easy if you will write the name repeatedly to be more familiar with the term and the spelling. Or, as presented, it will be easy to remember if you organize them based on their main action or location at least. After that, you are good to go. You may now proceed to part 2 of this module which will be dealing with the muscles of the neck, back, and the abdomen.